Well, the first time we saw the site um, was 10 years before we started to build. And we enjoyed, of course, the northern aspect and the way that it sits protected from the worst of the weather. Uh, but the most gorgeous thing about it was that the centre of the site was full of amazing trees, particularly the banks of the Serrata and the Integrifolia. And so that was important. We saw that as a room in itself. Yes, we had um, worked on uh, the neighbouring site for um, an extension to an existing house and it was organised so that all the rooms were across the, front or across the site facing the north but it also meant that the back of the house was then uh, excluded from the view and we knew that the power of the horizon was so great that it would be a wonderful thing to explore, setting that view up from the back of the site so that we chose to place the house to one side so that there's only a very small part of the house has a big view to the ocean. Mm, we were interested in the experience of the landscape beyond the site and the way that the land climbs up from the beach and folds up the hill to the top of the crest. And although our site was only a portion of that, that, throughout our site you can sense the hill going beyond the site boundaries and also folding down towards the ocean. And just knowing where you are uh, in the bigger landscape is an important part of that scheme. Well, it's really like a campsite in that respect and it is possible to occupy the site most times of the year out of doors. And so there was this opportunity and interest in uh, locating positions where the last of the afternoon sun in winter would, would fall and where the light comes in in the morning. And so if you could be high and look out to see uh, what the moon was doing. So there's just that interest in being out of doors and therefore there are only really two rooms to, into which to retreat when the weather is, is um, cold and windy and wet. And that one of those is around the fireplace that, that sits in against the earth of the site and another is around the, the kitchen warmth in the studio. Well, there's two sides to that. And one side is that the timber that we use and the, and the trees outside have a relationship. The house is part of the material quality of the landscape. And in the way that the tree has the trunk and the branches and the stems and the twigs, the house has some of those components much more formalised within it. And the, the timber on the level of in, uh, interaction with the site is also the fact that the timber construction of the main gallery that runs around is on a regular um, uh, grid, I suppose, or regular dimensions, all based on 600, 1200, 2400 and so forth. But the geometry of the two rooms that sit to make the, um, the abstracted garden are on an, a less regular grid, often approaching the Fibonacci series, in order that they can um, suggest and ingratiate themselves a little bit with the landscape. But the experimentation that we have always, or Peter also started this um, in very early houses, was to look at the way in which long pieces of hardwood can be used uh, in their green form and to resist the warping, twisting and cupping and that sort of unruly timber by, by actually uh, turning the grain against itself so two parts could be uh, cut or a whole part could be cut into two, reversed and then restrained and as they, the grains sit in opposition they tend to result in a very straight piece of timber so there is that. And then there is the effort to, to work with timbers from the island that come from um, a contractor who has the rights to take the thinnings 
out of the mining that unfortunately still happens on that island. And then other parts were pre-cut on site, uh, much uh, the, 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 the boxwood and, and the, um, and the uh, iron bark. Well, yes, it's an interesting um, combination because Graham Meller had started work with Peter in the late 1960s. And I, I was introduced to him and he also undertook some projects which I led. So in a way, he had a relationship with our practice over many, many years. And this was one of the last that he did, not quite the last, but almost one of the last. And so there was this, um, Although, as architects, we have knowledge about construction, we don't have the ongoing experience that um, Graham Meller could offer. And he was able to go on site and say, when the setup was there, he'd just stand at the top of the stair and he'd hum and high and he'd say, oh, it's, it's half an inch out, you know, or something. And then so it brought with him lots of skills, lots of skills. Well, if part of the interest is in the way that we can live closer with the surroundings, it seemed to us also that that occurs in association with things that we might have experienced in childhood or in our imagination. So to suggest that a, an outpost in among the trees at this high level deck, that it might be somehow a nest or a basket preferably a nest, uh, and because it's quite tight space, um, uh, came about in an interesting way in which it was built without that first. And then walking around and thinking about it and seeing it sitting there, understanding that in order for it to be a special place and not an extension of, an, of a, a much bigger space that's out of range, that it needed actually some way to have this metaphoric value as well as a, a shape to, to define it. And um, it is a favourite place to go and does conjure up places of um, childhood and, and tree houses and things like that. But it is a potential and the pragmatism comes out of, well you have to build it, it has to be conformed to the intentions of the larger project and it's about the balance between the practical and the, these imagined poetic elements. Because architecture, after all, if it's only poetics, it tends to fail the task of architecture. If it's only pragmatic, it fails its task of bringing these things together out of, uh, in some kind of uh, relationship, preferably in some sort of balance as well. Um, well, it, uh, I, it was conscious, of course, but it comes out of this relationship that you have uh, as one moves around. And the, 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 the little deck that sits out the front, it sits into the view and among the trees, is part of a long, thin, if you think of it as thin but narrow walkway. But you, one walks in and out into that walkway so that each time you move into that long, uh, um, uh, almost a gangplank, you, you turn and you see the view. So it's not that the view is always open, but it anticipates the way that one moves so that one can always catch that view. Yes, we, we were interested in that, what could be common and what could be the task of bringing um, the opposite ends of the spectrum together. And there is something about appetite, I think, and if there's too much big, then there's a yearning for the small, and if there's too much bright, there's where is the shadow. And it is an awareness that when you can bring these qualities closer together without losing what they are, you can experience them in the same place. The deck that looks over the ocean with a smaller view in among the trees was purposely set up to be the main place of seeing the ocean. 
and the narrow um, uh, passageway that leads to that um, goes extends from the room furthest into the hill, out past the sand court, and out past the studio room, and past um, uh, bed platforms that sit in small enclosures. And we were very aware of the movement between these small spaces and onto the long passageway, that that's where you captured the views. It's in the choreography or the anticipation of the way that one moves that the awareness of that view. So it wasn't that one, we imagined that everyone would have it be static and be looking out through one picture window, but rather that one would come across the view in movement. The, the core or the philosophy of the design was that we were interested in the way that the extreme conditions of the narrow, narrower corridor and the wider dimension and the double height of the spaces could be playing out between these extremes. And the, it seems to us if there's too much big, there's a search for the small and the cosy. And if there's too much bright light, then there's also the desire for being able to find shadows and corners. And so this understanding that there's this uh, balance in the appetites, but desire to go somewhere to the edges, is a wonderful thing that architecture can do. This synthesizing and bringing together of extremes in some relationship. And the long gallery was always thought of between us and discussed as being regular, ordered, a little bit um, demanding in, in its needs and smoother. All the timbers there tend to be dressed, whereas in the other two rooms there are um, rough sawn timbers. Um, the timbers from the island are, are left with their um, bark in some cases and certainly uh, with their knots and and the, the rafters and the battens in the ceiling of work on this Fibonacci series. So they were seen really as, as the two characters that we have and how to bring them together into the one building was, was mainly through the use of the similar material and the play of light and transparency that allows these to be experienced uh, as contrasts, as synthesised into one. Oh, this is a cheap building from the, apart from the labour that we put in. But it's not just that, it, it's almost austere in a way. And, um, and it's just um, the way that one can live at the beach and, and, and live in a climate as, that's in the subtropics and, and a place where you can spend a lot of time out of doors. Uh, everything can get covered in sand, blown in by storms and and leaves and it's, um, it's just part of being in that, part, part of enjoying the land and part of enjoying the place that you're in. So if there's too much uh, other around then um, there's making more work for yourself but also it's unnecessary and we quite like that austerity a little bit. Just because you can always make it comf comfortable around you with, a, with a, soft cloths and things. I think so because when one's there just as one or two it feels roomy and when there's lots of guests there are places that one can occupy in the semi-enclosed spaces and it, it feels enough and it has to be I think uh, understood as that the terrain is the house and that one can sort of lay out in the, under trees and on the decks and... People are surprised when they come there to see how small it is and also that it's not, it's not, um, it's quite rough in parts and, and uh, very uh, simple. But I think people who do visit it who are, are struck by the light, the use of the, of the way that it its transparency work, but also its containment. And um, the definition of the outside space is it's light-handed, but it's there. All the places are shaped and form is given, all the dimensions are there, but it's not, none of it is um, insistent 
in spatial terms. And uh, I think people are dreamers. And there's a child there. Even the most hard nose come away saying, well, it's just like a kid's tree house, what are you up to? And others go, oh, this is a place I could settle into. So there are different responses and it's not for everybody, but it does appeal to the, the dreamer, I think.